Les Catacombes de Paris, Putain de Mer. It had been a stressful day for Philippe Herbser. It had been a stressful day for tout le monde. Revolution was in the air. King Louis XVI had been stripped of his titles and imprisoned at Le Temple. In the months since, he'd been plain old citoyen Louis Capet. It was January 21st, 1793, and Abser had been given the morning off work at the Hôpital d'Instruction des Armées du Val de Grasse to go and see the execution. During the recent tumultuous years, public executions had become the main form of public entertainment, acting like a tap in a barrel or a cut in a blister to let the tension drain away like bloody pus. Too often, the peasants celebrated the death, thronging the rues and the avenues as though it was a festival. Minstrels would play, innkeepers would play their ale, and the prostitutes would offer discounts. But on that cold, rainy day in January, the atmosphere was muted and more like a funeral than a party. The doom and gloom was contagious. Abser was just another face in the crowd, one of tens of thousands of people who'd flocked the silent streets to watch as Citoyen Louis Capet was taken from Le Temps to hear his indictment and the accusation of high treason and crimes against the state. They took him to the Place de la Révolution, where Abser bought some ale from one of the street vendors and watched as he was led up the steps of a wooden platform. Even with the thousands of spectators in the square, the former king's last words reached Abser's ears with the power and clarity of a lightning strike. Louis was 38, but he had the voice of a younger man and the authority of an older one. Avez-vous des derniers mots? Mais bien sûr, Louis replied. He spoke in a clear voice and looked General Santor in the eyes before turning to address the gathered crowds. Je suis la pardonner ceux qui sont la cause de ma mort. Je me innocent de tous les crimes dont je suis accusé. Je pardonne à mes ennemis et je prie Dieu que mon sang soit utile aux Français et qu'il apaise la colère de Dieu. Je... Abser could tell that the former king wanted to say more, and so could the thousands of silent onlookers, but it wasn't to be. General Santor raised his hand and his troops leapt into action. Two of them grabbed the condemned by the arms and frog marched him across to the guillotine, while two more spun their sticks into action and began a drum roll. The boom of the snares echoed out throughout the streets like the rumble of thunder ahead of the lightning, drowning out anything else that Louis was trying to say. Abser could see his lips moving, but the words didn't carry. Death came quickly, but not cleanly. Abser was pushed forward as the crowd surged behind him, and his view of the former king was blocked for a moment or two. When he saw him again, he'd already been lowered into place, his head locked in the stocks of the guillotine as the drumming reached a crescendo. Time stood still. The history books beckoned. Then the drum roll stopped as abruptly as it started as the sunlight glinted off the guillotine's blade. It dropped down, piercing the air as it rattled in the woodwork and struck Citoyen Louis Capet in the back of the net. The guillotine was a new invention, and it was yet to be perfected. When it hit Louis's neck, it only sliced through three quarters of the gristle, sticking into the bone like the sword in the stone. Santor's men rushed forward and worked the blade free, resetting the blade as quickly as they could. In the meantime, Louis's head dangled from his neck like a flag at half-mast, still connected by a thin strip of flesh. The former king's unseeing eyes had rolled back into their sockets, and his body was twitching in the stock. Santor bellowed an order and the guillotine dropped through the air for a second time, finally severing the spinal column and sending the head clattering into the basket below. The crowd rushed forward but the silence still held, though it was tinged with disbelief. Then it broke like a wave on the shore and the peasants and the aristocrats alike started bellowing insults as they pushed and shoved their way to the front. Abser was among them and he followed suit as they pulled mouchoirs from their pockets and dipped them into the dead king's blood to make a grisly souvenir. Abser didn't make much from his job at Val de Grasse, and if he could find a willing buyer for his mouchoir, he could turn enough of a profit for a hot meal or two. He stuffed the bloody rag in his pocket and then pushed his way backwards through the crowd to the other side of the Place de la Révolution, and then from there towards the hospital. It was a stressful shift, and Louis's execution was like a bloody prelude to the work that went on in the hospital's operating rooms. The doctors were little more than butchers, sawing off atrophied limbs without anaesthetic or antibiotics. Most nights, Abser took the screams of the patients home with him, along with a flagon or two of wine to help him sleep. Abser worked as a porter, which meant that it was his job to fetch anything that needed fetching. That mostly meant going down to the cellars to bring up spirits for the patients who were going into surgery. The liquor was the only thing they had to take the pain away, so the doctors made sure they were good and drunk and then strapped them to a gurney like a lunatic in an asylum. Half of them didn't survive the surgery, and half of those that did would succumb to infection, blood loss or some other complication. The hospital's morgue was the busiest in the city, and the hospital itself was built over dozens of underground tunnels that led to the ancient limestone quarries. It was where they buried their dead. Val de Grasse was also built over an extensive wine cellar, and it was in the cellar where Abser began his final, fateful journey. He'd been sent down for the seventh time that day to bring up more of the all-important alcohol, and he was already wrong common coeur de pere. One of the perks of the job, in fact the reason why he'd taken it in the first place, was that he could partake of the liquor himself, as he often did.
It was the liquor that led to his great mistake, his grand error. He took a left when he should have hit a right, then compounded his error by taking a couple more wrong turns and then sitting down to gather his thoughts. By the time that he stood back up again, he couldn't remember which direction he'd come from. Putain de merde, he said for the second time that day. Je me suis perdu. Worse still, he was in the one place that he didn't want to get lost in. He was lost in the catacombs, the final resting place of millions of the city's dead. Paris was the second largest city in Europe, but the dead outnumbered the living by nearly 10 to 1, and Absair was at risk of becoming just another statistic. His muddled thoughts regathered as much as he could manage. He continued onwards, taking turns at random and praying to God that his single candle would continue to light the way until he found the exit. But Absair was drunk, and it felt like he was getting drunker as the spirits he'd been drinking continued to be broken down inside him. He kept walking, noticing in the dimming light that the smooth limestone walls were now lined with skulls, ribs and femurs. He'd passed through the quarry and reached the head of the catacombs, and that was bad news. He'd never ventured that deep before, not many people had. The candle flickered in an unseen breeze, and Absair cupped his hands around the flame. It still had another hour or so of life left, but he didn't have anything to light it with. The candle was his only remaining link to the world above. Well, that and the blood-stained handkerchief that was still balled up in his pocket. Absair continued to walk, stopping every now and then to look around in the vain hope that he'd see some sort of landmark. But there was nothing. Just the bones of the forgotten dead and the stench of damp earth and dead animals. Those unfortunates that had found their way into the catacombs and died there. Absair hoped he wasn't destined to join them. The candle lasted for another 45 minutes, and then the last of the wick burned down and the wax melted off and trickled into the dirt, scalding Absair's hand as it did so. He hardly noticed. Absair had long since lost all sense of time, but he guessed that a new day had dawned from the voices he heard. There was an old legend that Absair had never thought about before, but which was now filtering its way back through his mind as he wandered to and fro in the darkness. It was a legend that was passed around in the drinking houses between the lower classes, and one that would have horrified the clergymen if they'd overheard it during the huddles after their sermons. They said that every night after midnight the walls started to speak, and that night they were talking to Philibert Absair. Tonnez à gauche. No, pas à gauche. Tonnez à droite. Continuez tout droit. Arrêtez ici. Tonnez-vous. Là-bas. Vous êtes perdu. Vous êtes loin de la ville d'en haut. According to the legends, the voices tried to persuade the unwary to go deeper into the labyrinth beneath the city, but given that Absair was already lost, that didn't make much difference. The voices were ethereal and often difficult to understand, like listening to a drunk over the babble of a couple dozen conversations. He didn't know whether to follow their directions or not, but it didn't much matter. They were trying to guide him in every direction imaginable, and while one of the suggestions was likely true, he had no way of knowing which one. In the darkness beneath the city, Absair dropped the candle stub and put his hands over his ears. Then he struck off in a random direction, praying to a god that he didn't believe in to let him see the light again. His body was found 11 years later, and even then it was only by chance. The secret routes beneath the city had a strange attraction for the living who'd one day be buried there, and those self-professed cataphiles had taken to exploring them by torchlight. They were better prepared than Absair, equipped with enough food, drink, candles and torches to last for weeks, and even that wasn't always enough. Absair was far from the only man to die down there. The sixth strong group that found his remains had been trying to create a map of the underground, a thankless task that many thought was impossible. No one knew just how big the catacombs were, but there were rumours that it was larger than the city above, spread across multiple levels and with more dead ends than a thousand hedge mazes. Absair might not have been found at all if it hadn't been for the tragic fact that he was less than 50 yards from an exit that led out onto Rue de la Grenelle. Absair's body was too far gone for them to have identified him, even if they'd known him, which they didn't. But one of the six was a doctor who'd once worked in Val de Grasse, and he recognised the hospital's insignia on the keys that were hanging from the belt. He'd heard all of the urban legends that did the rounds on the hospital wards, and Absair's disappearance was an unsolved mystery that had stuck with him. And now he had an answer. The missing man had been found close enough to an exit that he could easily have been taken out of the catacombs and buried above ground, but the city's graveyards were already full and Absair hadn't left a family behind, and so there was no one to lobby for him to be buried in a cimetière. And so he'd been buried at the spot where he died, in a ceremony that was witnessed by the six cataphiles and a representative from the undertakers who'd been tasked with building his headstone. It had been paid for by one of the hospital's wealthy benefactors and was bestowed with a simple message. Derrière la mémoire de Philibert Absair, moi ici dans l'obscurité.